Each Sunday night, I'd watch the practice with none of my friends. I'd turn the dial to ABC to see the creep of the week that Bobby Donald defends. But I'm out of practice. With your hosts, Keith Barney and... A true American original, Mike and Eglio. Way back in high school, most every night, my mom watched QVC, so I missed the practice. There was no TiVo, what could I do? Wait 15 years, get fat, then stream it on Hulu. There are so many good reasons for me to be choking back rage. But it's just sports. Mm. And I'm still mad, even though it's the second time we've done this. (laughs) Quarantine work makes the dream work. (laughs) You got it in this time. Congratulations. Uh Yeah, thank you. And welcome to the Out of Practice Podcast, a weekly podcast in which me, I'm Keith. I discuss David E. Kelly's award-winning series, The Practice, with my buddy Mike. Uh, That's Mike. (laughs) That's Mike. There we mm-hmm. go. I am here. Uh, this week, we are up to Season 7, Episode 18, Capital Crimes. I'm excited to talk about that episode, this episode, but I'm also excited to catch up with uh, our world-traveling Mike. I d- haven't heard any of the stories. I don't know what happened about anything. Mike, you went on a globe-trotting uh, trip throughout South America, uh, and I'd like to know how to go. Well... You know, there were ups, there were downs. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of things. I'll give you the highlights, the lowlights, and in, everything in between here. If yeah, you are yeah. uninterested in this, which is, uh, I don't blame you, go ahead and just uh, skip forward. We've got mm-hmm. the show, we, we link to the actual episode uh, in the notes, so you can ignore all this, Michigas. But anyway, I was supposed to go on a four-day, real quick, jump on, jump off, cruise, one show, 145 minutes, and then come on home. It didn't turn out that way. We were on a very lovely line. The boat, they were very nice. We jumped on the boat in um, Cartagena, which is was beautiful. We had an overnight there, and my uh, some of my castmates, one of which I was meeting for the first time, went and had a lovely dinner in Colombia. Beautiful meat they have there. It was very tasty. So cheap. <laughs> so cheap. I had like Top shelf liquor, this beautiful steak, all this stuff. I was ready to drop a hundred dollars. Keith, you know how much it was? I thought I thought I had spent about a hundred and fifty dollars. Okay, and how much on this did like you spend? beautiful meal? Yeah, great yeah, memory. It was eighteen dollars. What? It was eighteen dollars American. Now, did they give you a deal because you nope, were? It's just really cheap. Wow, Colombia, go for the drugs, stay for the cheap food. Yeah, yeah, the, the the drugs are expensive, but the food is cheap. So anyway, we get on the ship. Uh, it is, you know, the cruise line, the cruise industry. I will say this, though, they are getting like hammered by the CDC, which is understandable. I mean, they are generally floating sort of exchanges of petri dishes. Yes, they've really stepped up their game as far as san- sanitation. I mean, there are pe- poor people whose job is to make sure that literally every person that walks into the food, the Lido deck, as they call it, washes their hands. I mean. They watch you wash your hands. Every person, every time, there is, they're handing out KN95 masks. They're doing their best to enforce wearing them. They're doing the, the best they can. So I, 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 yeah. relative, I feel safe with their, their measures. But at the end of the day, safety in, in, this, in this environment comes down to people and compliance. And let me just say, I heard more than one person. So they're testing every, every staff person every day, but they mm-hmm. cannot keep up that type of testing with the passengers. So it's really just, if you're having symptoms or something and you call medical, they send up a hazmat suit and they do all the testing. So more than one person I overheard on a FaceTime call or I saw texting, they're like, yeah, we've got, I've got COVID, I'm feeling it or blah, 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 but don't worry, I haven't said anything. Like they're getting away with something. I mean, not just one person, Keith. So So I literally wore a KN95 mask for all but about 45 minutes for a week. Yeah. Anyway, so... That's smart. We, we go on to perform the first night. 
it went, you know, it goes okay. Sometimes these gigs are tough because you go sing your brains out. And I'm singing really high, hard things. And, uh, you know, 12 people show up or whatever. So forget that aside. We're supposed to, we get through it. It's fine. Uh, we're, we're going, pulling into Jamaica. I'm going to jump off in Jamaica and fly home. Yep. Jamaica says, hell no, you cannot come here. Which yep. was something I had, didn't even really consider was an, op- an a thing that could happen. So we we were literally trapped. So we were stuck on the ship. Then they asked us to do another show since you know you guys are around. And I was like, every and all the guys were like, yeah, sure. And then I had to be the grown up who was like, yeah, but here's the thing. I agreed to do one show for this much money, and now I have to stay on the ship for two extra days and do a whole nother show. That's unfortunately I can't just say yes, right? So it was a whole thing, which it was a whole thing. But finally, we got it worked out. We did another show. So then they rebook us our flights on Saturday, three days later, out of Fort Lauderdale because, oh, and this is after being tested every day. And usually, you know, I'm vaxxed and boosted and all. I've been doing my compliance. But they, if you, if you catch it, they kick you off the boat. I mean, you are, wherever you're at, you go away, right? So every test, I wish I could show you my watch because like the, my heart rate would, it was just like the stress, the stress was oh, killing me. And oh you know what stress God. does to your voice, Keith? I don't know if you ever tried to sing oh, it does constantly great. It stressed It really out. helps. Really um, helps when you're uh, stressed This out, was yeah. not my greatest vocal performance. I can tell you that, buddy. <laughs> uh, anyway, so I passed this gauntlet of tests and then we get to Florida finally and Florida's like, nah, we don't even need a test. Come on in. So uh, Florida doesn't give a shit. Yeah. Florida will... We'll just like, come on in, lick us, lick us with your COVID. But because we didn't get off, we didn't get on the ship during a regular embarkation, they kicked us off the ship at 6 a.m. through this like special custom. So now I'm just like in Fort Lauderdale at 6 a.m. The flight they give me doesn't leave until 11 p.m. 11 p.m. And I told them, I was like, guys, I had to be home three days ago. Now you're making me 11 p.m. flight into Newark and then I got to travel to Philadelphia. I was like, hell no. Long story short, I just was like, you know what? F it. I booked my own flight home. I paid the money that I got paid to just fly home. I get home and I find out after dodging the gauntlet of wait for a it, thousand, wait for it, a thousand people mm-hmm. on uh, a ship, five tests, six, which, eight which tests. The night, the night you left for that ship, the CDC announced you shouldn't go on any cruise yeah. ships. Yeah, it, it was a whole thing. Um, I texted you at like midnight. There was a booger on my wall next to the bed, so I ended up like moving my bed across. I mean, every, it was just not the thing I wanted to be doing. Mm-hmm. I get in the car. CEO Jen has an ND5 and KN95 mask on, and she's she's got the variant. So I, I dodged all the bullets <laughs> to get into the car with the virus. She's uh, luckily only mildly symptomatic. Uh, she can't. Her face is just all snot. She cannot breathe, but I mean, I'll take that. If that's what I'm going to get, I'll take it. Yeah, yeah. Well, she's yes. I that is uh, that is an unbelievable uh, story here. So, uh, wow. Oh, oh, that's, I didn't uh, even, wait. So, and as I'm getting off the ship, I find out that the other group of four guys that were on the other ship, one of those guys tests positive. He's of out, course. and now it's like the whole next couple weeks of gigs, and they're like, "Can you cover this guy in Florida?" And I'm like, uh, "No." I think I think I need to just be here now, and I should. Yeah. I mean, following guidelines, I believe I've been f- traveling international, so I should probably just stay in my house for the next five to six days. Yes, yeah, no, that I mean, well, uh, uh, you have a close contact. Hello, true. Oh, my you, nephew. You, yeah, I mean, you it's live just... with somebody who actively has COVID at the moment, so You're yeah, right. you need to be quarantining, sir. Mm-hmm. But luckily, for don't worry. The you... speaker, the speaker of the podcast is uh, as CEO Jen is down for the count right now. The speaker of the podcast will be uh, in the chamber in, in in case we need a new president. Sorry, that was that. a that was like a polit. I was trying to do like a political thing, like joke analogy, but oh, didn't really. oh, I see, I I see. All right, all right. So you, the, if she uh, can't you're... fulfill her duties right now while she's in okay, quarantine, watching all, right. all of the so, Marvel Marvel movies very loudly in the other room. So who is the um, who's the designated survivor for the podcast? That's what Charlie. I'd like to know. I think it's Charlie. Charlie. Charlie is the designated survivor on the podcast. Which brings me to 
another thing to fill everybody in on. I know it's been written. People have we been. We have tried for years yeah, so yep. to make I was this with podcast you. a success. We, we failed. failed. It's time to give the world what it was. <laughs> Hot cat content. Meow, meow. Hot cat content. Meow, meow. Hot cat content. Meow. It should be noted my cats didn't give a shit that I was gone, and they sure as hell didn't care that I came back. Uh, par for the course for cats. But I did want to right. give an update. You might recall a few weeks back, I gave a ba- a, a, a a farewell to Fishy, who was really down mm-hmm. for the count. Folks, mm-hmm. that fish made a 100% complete recovery. Amazing. Well, I, you said you made it your business to keep that fish alive. And- he, all he needed, I, I, I did a little, betta fish, ladies and germs, really want to be in water that is 76 to 82 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, oh. Most people think they can just throw them in tap water and that's the best way. They're hardy, so they're okay. But he was he was like sixty eight to seventy here, so he was basically frozen to death, I think. And so I just warmed oh. him up slowly, and uh, Bing Bang Boom, he's feeling good. Did so, fine. Uh, we we uh, we we did it. Well, there it is, folks. Keep <laughs> your beta fish warm, guys. Twelve minutes in, we haven't even discussed anything of pertinence. Well, we no, no, no. Look, I'm sure everyone was wondering what was going on with your crazy ship adventure. Mm-hmm. And I've, I've now was like, you know what? I need to turn on this other light. And then it's, it's turned on so crazy. So I... Uh, but there are people just on these cruise ships, just like beached whales, just like no no fear. Just they just don't give a shit. And there were children, Keith. There were vaccinated children on this boat. And it's... uh. It's it's some man. I don't know. I I understand. Live your life. Don't get me wrong. But like, you know, and I feel bad. For, I don't feel bad. I'm a very conflicting minds. I've made a handsome amount of money from the cruise industry, so I don't want to be a hypocrite in bashing it. Right. But you know, like even in the best of times, uh, they're just floating garbage disposals in the uh, in the middle of the ocean, just like actively destroying the world. So. I don't want to like champion them. I, I will give them credit for being the most, uh, what's the word I'm looking for when you are impugned with a ton of restriction and regulation? Well, that's the, of, of all the industries. I mean, what's funny is that they're, they're so regulated as far as their COVID protocols and diligent. I have to say, every ship I've been on during COVID has really been, has, I've felt safe aboard them. However, you then get on a plane Going into an airport across the country, uh, Philadelphia, yeah, I was at JFK, I was in uh, Fort Lauderdale. It's just people snacking, coughing, hacking. Clearly, COVID's every, it's everywhere. And I was on yeah. three packed flights. I mean, not a seat to be seen. So, you know, to then that for them to be like, oh, yeah, don't get on a cruise. I'm like, well, yeah, but don't go anywhere. Like, don't get on right. a plane. If you got any sense, do not get on a plane. Do not do it. Don't even go yeah. near the airport. It is it is hellscapes of sickness. Yeah. Yeah. Well, there you go. This episode brought to you by... Uh, Mike's the, Travel Report. The TSA. Uh, do you want to die? <laughs> go and fly. Yes, exactly. Hop on to uh, Delta Airlines now serving Gorbachev. <laughs> oh, I forgot about Gorbachev. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god all right all right let us that ha- you know honestly i've been like, genuinely fascinated and wanted to hear about all of that and i'm sure i'm not the only one but jen I'm has sure- now jen has now caught every variant of covid it's it's impressive she's and really not- uh she's a completist you know mm-hmm. as a collector i understand you want every possible variant it's uh it's it's definitely uh there it is so poor jen uh, glad she's doing okay. Well, folks, uh, I bet there's a few of you out there who are also very happy for us to move on to a segment called Filings and Subpoenas. Filings and Subpoenas. Filings and Subpoenas. Filings and Subpoenas. Mike, if people would like to write in uh, their own travel reviews, their own pandemic travel reviews, how would they do that? Well, uh, you'd think uh, this was a pandemic travel podcast, but it's not. But we'd still Mm. like to hear about it. In fact, we are just so desperate for communication and human contact. Uh, Write us about anything. And you can do so at outofpracticepodcast at gmail.com. 
mm. don't uh, want to write an email because it's too much, ta it's too taxing on the fingies, that's fine. Go ahead and just use your thumbs to tap us out on Instagram or a Facebook message at Out of Practice Podcast. You can do that any time of the day. Keith and I don't sleep because of uh, sheer anxiety. Oh, wow. I, I feel like we're, we're getting a real window into Mike's head this episode, which is I mean, every episode is that way. But like right now, Mike's he's been on a thousand flights. He's been all over the world. He's oh, here, I have he's an existential crisis because I, I pre-committed uh, because a friend of mine got COVID and I promised him so that I would take his spot. and I have to go two shows uh, two weeks from now. 22nd and 23rd in at a, on a Shady Pines tour, which is basically the Florida rest homes. I got to do two shows uh, during this this wave uh, in Florida for old people, and it's against everything I believe. And I'm really having a uh, a time about it. Yeah. Well, are they are they giving you enough money to not care about your feelings, or? Well, enough money is, is changing every day. Like I have a, <laughs> I make enough money. I, I don't need to be doing, and I, I'm not really fulfilled creatively anymore by this. So uh, the answer would probably be no. But I'm doing it for a buddy to help him. So I'm going to do that. Is, is this becoming a career intervention here for for Mike here? This is a. Uh... Um, it used to be fun. It's no longer fun. So I, I think I think this Florida. I, you're here to hear heard it here first, folks. This Florida uh, Shady Pines situation might be uh my swan song fair enough uh you know of shady pine uh gigs all right well uh what are we doing oh filings and subpoenas so uh we heard from our good friend and moderator phoenix cage who uh has some interesting trivia about last week's episode um now if you remember we had our uh introduction of uh bobby's ex coming in who we talked about uh, was previously cast as Bridget Fonda. And then uh, she was unable to do it because of a car accident. So Phoenix says, Keith beat me to the same piece of trivia that I discovered, that Bridget Fonda was cast as Sarah, but flipped her car on the day of shooting. However, I also dug a bit deeper to learn, and that even, uh, to learn that even though her injuries were minor, at least as back injuries go, she never acted again. Um, and actually, she she did fracture a vertebrae. Uh, he continues, that, that fact feels slightly ironic, given that despite being a quadriplegic, Christopher Reeves was acting in that episode. Of course, I don't know if the injury is what sidelined her, uh, or if the accident just made her reevaluate her priorities. priorities. I'm just pointing out arbitrary connections because it's a thing to do, much like podcasting. Uh, but yeah, it's it, I I did not when I read that I was like that can't possibly be true, Phoenix, and it is. Uh, she she retired from acting uh, right then, and I don't know if that was uh, the cause or not. She you know the the story what she said was that she was retiring from acting to start a family with her husband Danny Elfman, composer Danny Elfman. Um, but uh, yeah, so it's very. Uh, very interesting. Also of note, if you go down the Bridget Fonda rabbit hole, she was offered the part of Ally McBeal. Huh. Interesting. Uh, and uh, and turned it down without reading it because she knew she would probably like it and didn't want to get into television. So a uh, lot of interesting historical connections there. But David E. Kelly clearly filed it away. Like, I do want to work with Bridget Fonda and probably wrote this part for her. Um, so, uh, yeah. Really interesting little piece of, piece of trivia. Thank you very much. Phoenix Cage. All right, Mike. Anybody else in filings and subpoena? That's what I got. That's what I got today. All right. Well, then I think it's, um, before we move on, I think that um, it might be uh, just an appropriate time to say that between last episode and this episode, we had a trio of television uh, sort of mainstays, for me at least, uh, not just television, entertainment, yeah. uh, pass away. Sidney Poitier, I think, number one should go as just, I think, and I just a, an artist who had to overcome so much in order to just practice his craft. So hats off to Sidney Poitier. Uh, Betty White, who was a television right. television icon uh, and also a humanitarian icon, I should say, an animal lover and, and has done so much. But also, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, a guest star with a, a bit of a run on Boston Legal. 
So, oh yeah, we might see a little Betty at some point in the David E. Kelly world. So connected to the to the universe we're in, and then just last night, uh, news of Bob Saget, who yeah, uh, who you know, there's a lot of rumors about Bob Saget, but it turns out actually, from what I understand, is a pretty pretty good human being. From people I know who have, who know him, uh, knew mm-hmm. him personally, pretty a pretty good guy, uh, really funny guy, and just a seminal presence in my life. I mean, yeah. Full House, uh, one of my top five favorite just media consumption things I've ever done and also America's Funniest Home Videos. I mean, Bob Saget hosted YouTube before YouTube. That's right. Yeah, he sure did. And uh, a, a director and and a just a, a, a tough trio. I'm sure, many, you know, it's a time of loss for a lot of people. I just want to point those out because they are uh, in the universe with yeah. which we speak. Yeah, indeed. And uh, yeah, I mean, uh, talk about three... Three legends. I mean, I don't, I don't know many people who had much connection with Betty White or Sidney Poitier, but, but plenty of people worked with Bob because um, he did a bunch of Broadway stuff. Mm-hmm. Great, recently. a great, a great story from I read on Twitter last night from Bob Martin, who I know uh, from Drowsy Chaperone. We've talked about Drowsy Chaperone, and uh, Bob Saget made his. He had done you know a lot of television, and he made his Broadway debut as Man and Chair in Drowsy Chaperone. Mm-hmm. And after his his debut. A man who has done so much, made so much money in television, and his family will continue to receive those residuals, I'm pretty sure, uh, ran off stage after a man in chair and just, like, was weeping and so so appreciative. So someone who could appreciate the art yeah. even ever after having reached success is always is always something that I admire. No, no, and it, he, he respected the art form, which is all of what I ask, especially when somebody big like that comes in as a sort of a stunt casting. Like, just respect the art form, and he... You know, the, the friends that I had that worked with him in Hand to God mm-hmm. on Broadway as well, the play, like I said, he was just a lovely, lovely person. Uh, all right. Let us now hop back into the time machine, into uh, a, a, a different time. I would say a simpler time, and in some ways a simpler time, but in some ways not. We are going to talk about March 31st, the year 2003, and it is time to ask Mike, what were you doing this day in the basement? Well, why don't we start with you, Keith, since I, uh, I guess, have the picture up. Oh, okay. There it is. Yeah. So, uh, so I was, of course, going back into the emails because I've, I've got her emails and by her, I mean me and there aren't 30,000, there's 98,000. Uh, and, uh, discovered that the Time magazine this week featured a picture from the original Three Tenors concert, which uh, took place in Rome in 1990. I don't know why it was in there, whether it was an article about opera or an article retrospective of something, something. I don't know. Uh, However, in that uh, Three Tenors picture printed here in Time magazine, in the background is my aunt. Claudia playing viola. Hey, uh, because uh, my my aunt and uh, my uncle were both uh, members of the Magia Musicale um, Orchestra in Florence, Italy. Uh, Zubin Mehta was the uh, conductor, and they played the first three tenors concert. So we were emailing around like, "Hey, is the, uh, you know like because we knew that they were." You know, they'd play the show, but like, oh, is that Claudia? It's hard to tell. And of course, we did confirm with her that it is indeed her in the background uh, there between uh, Carreras and Domingo uh, in the background playing uh, first chair viola. And my uh, uncle was the uh, French horn player. You know, after one of the Schmerzy boys, uh, this I could see this guy. You can always tell who's about to come and make a comment. And the thing about cruise mm-hmm. ships specifically is... You generally, if you decide, if someone decides to come up to you and like discuss the performance, you'd think they're going to compliment you. I mean, if you're going to make the effort, right. no, it's only about sixty forty. Uh, many times they have uh, varying opinions. This one time, this lady in a in pink bunny slippers at the buffet came up to one of my colleagues and was like, "She's like, I know you're really giving it everything got up there. It's awesome. We really appreciate it." He's like, "Great." She's like, "You could use a little more soul." And you're like, what? "You're wearing pink bunny slippers." Uh, oh my god. Anyway, this guy, I could see him formulating something in his head and then he made a beeline for us and I was like okay here we go and he comes and he just says hey you know what they were going to name the group when Pavarotti joined it and I was like what's that and he goes the three tonners because Pavarotti is fat Keith 
Bonanza. The, oh yes, yes, and 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 this was he was going to join the Four Seasons. No, uh, the group that I travel with at this point is called the the Jersey called the tenors. Jersey Tenors. So he, right. this was his big moment to use his three tonners joke, and uh, three he, yeah he went for it. Uh, there, there it is. Yeah. Well, yeah. Uh, zing! Take that, Ghost yep. of Pavarotti. <laughs> <laughs> you're fat that's that is fat shaming hilarious. the dead Pavarotti anyhow Keith this time I remember it's funny we're talking about seminal television shows uh, mm -hmm. uh, so you remember the original TGIF of course and one of gonna my have some fun show how it's done TGIF one of my favorite shows I believe it was uh, well well the original TGIF Eventually, Family Matters was on. There was Full House followed by Family Matters. But Family mm -hmm. Matters, trivia, trivia, was a spinoff of another sitcom that was a TGIF staple. You recall? It took place in Chicago. I'll give I you a hint. I recall that it happened, yes. I'll give you a hint. Harriet Winslow, the matriarch of the Winslow right. family, right. originally was a character who was an elevator operator in a department oh, store in Chicago. That was run by two cousins. Oh, different strokes. Uh, no. Perfect Strangers. Perfect Strangers. Perfect Strangers. strangers oh starring which two actors, Keith? Uh, celebrated, uh, celebrated character actor. Of course, uh, uh, Mark. Uh, no, Bronson Pinchot. Bronson Pinchot and as uh, Balky and Marklin Baker. And Marklin Baker. Who starred in a performance of a musical I went to see on Broadway on in April of 2003? Okay, uh, it would be Frog and Toad or Friends. Frog and Toad, a year with Frog and Toad the musical I went to see, be, just because I loved Perfect Strangers. Uh, I don't know Mark, but uh, I wanted to see the show, and uh, I didn't know at the time Mark Lynn Baker was such a he's such a stage guy. He's such a he's done a oh, million. Oh, things. absolutely. That's his whole. That was his bread and butter. And uh, I don't know how history has remembered you with Frog and Toad, but I thought it was delightful. A fond memory of at the theater. It was cheap as hell. I got tickets through school. I believe it was in previews when I saw it. I did see it in March, I believe. Sure. Uh, I think it opened April 13th. I looked it up earlier. Anyhow, uh, that's what I was doing. So a little uh, closed circle there. I was seeing you with Frog and Toad uh, that I would audition for later when it would tour with TheaterWorks. And Keith, little known fact, Mm. I didn't get it. Oh, it would no join. A, it would join a long list of shows that I would make to the very final callbacks, and uh, you know, not. Get I mean, it. look, you have been rejected by some really fine theater. Some of the best there. Yeah, some, some of the of best. The best. That's so interesting. Uh, Mark's wife directed me in Les Mis once. Actually, I would love to. I've always uh, jokingly wanted to write a little uh, cabaret uh, called Almost. Almost. So I, I yeah. Got quite a list of almost. Yeah, no, I think that's a, you know what, that's that's not a bad idea. Like, the, yeah, it should be like things I didn't get. I'm going to mm -hmm. perform an entire night of yeah. things that I, uh. But like, I, the the, the trick of it is, is that you can't, because, you, you know, people do that. But like, it's always with this, like, I, uh, I didn't get it, but with this angst. But I don't feel that angst. I'm, as I've gotten older, I'm like, that was pretty awesome. Like, yeah. You know. Well, I mean, it in and, you know, I say it tongue in cheek about being rejected by all these great things, like. In order to get rejected at that level is quite an accomplishment. That like said, it, it, it really is. That said, if you'll recall my story, I was an intern. I wasn't an intern. I got paid. I was a peon for the uh, National Alliance for Musical Theater. Mm -hmm. That's how I know Drowsy Chaperone. <laughs> I've my name is on so many rejection letters to like mm -hmm. big composers just because yeah. I was the guy manning the desk. That uh, rejection isn't always a brush with fame. Sometimes it's a brush with some guy making twelve dollars an hour. Well, no, that's true. That's true. But uh, no, I mean, but you know, if you if you got that close with these things, like you know, you had to, you, you can't just walk in off the street and get rejected by uh, by these big productions. So, mm -hmm. congratulations, congratulations Thanks, on buddy. your on, uh, on on your failure, but like impressive failure. Hey man, it means a lot coming from you. You've been you've, yeah. you've also uh, been rejected. I, by I know I know a great deal about <laughs> failure. <laughs> All right, folks, you know what it's time for. 
It's time for the Out of Practice Podcasts This Day in the World. The greatest hits, the biggest movies, headlines from Vermont, essential sports updates, and for some inexplicable reason, the weather from 20 years ago. Now back to Keith and Mike. Well, folks, here we are in March 31st, the year 2003. Uh, If you're playing at home, that's just one day after Scott, my younger brother's 19th birthday. Happy birthday, Scott. 20th birthday. No. uh, Yeah, 20th birthday. Jesus. All right. The local paper, the Bruin Free Press, talked about allied troops advancing. U.S. kills 100 Iraqi fighters because we were deep into the Iraq war at that point. The top movie was Head of State, the Chris Rock and Bernie Mac film. And the top song continued to be In the Club by 50 Cent. Who's doing our cover today, Mike? Well, Keith, this is one of my favorites. This is a a YouTube channel called Good Fortune, and it's In the Club, except it's Led Zeppelin. (laughs) Amazing. I love it. That's great. That's one of my favorite covers we have done so far. Now it is time for everybody's favorite segment. It's time. It's time, it's time, it's time. It's time for sports. Balls. The Boston Hockey Bruins tied the Tampa Bay Lightning 2-2 in the Fleet Center. A tie, you say? Yup. Up into the 2005-2006 season, the NHL would end games in ties if no team scored in overtime. After the rule change, regular season games still tied after a five-minute overtime period would be finished in a shootout. They're exciting, but they're not really hockey. So uh, I will continue our little little information here because I think it's interesting. The NHL has instituted more changes to make them less likely. Uh, shootouts, that is. Reducing the players in overtime from 5-on-5 five five to 4-on-4 four four, and currently to 3-on-3 three three to encourage games ending in a hockey goal, not a skills competition. Uh, there it is, ties. Ties in sports. We almost had one last night. That would have been Should've very had one consequential. Last night. Would have you know, been. And, uh, and and I think that the reason I was rooting for it was only not because I care about either of those teams. It's because I wanted Ben to have to retire on his couch with no say in it. That's what I really wanted to happen because he deserves it because he's a garbage human. Because, <laughs> uh, yeah, well, you know, not everyone's rooting for uh, Ben Raplesberger. Okay, so uh, in case you're wondering in real life, we're recording this on the 10th of January, 2022. Uh, So the final game of the season, the NFL season, was the Raiders-Chargers. Anyway, you know, if you're listening to this in 10 years, I'm like, what the hell are they talking about? But I think what the hell are they talking about is a very... No one's listening to this 10 years from now. No one's one's listening to it now. (laughs) All right. I'm a human being, <laughs> god damn it! My life has value, and I'm not gonna take this anymore! It's time to talk about the damn episode! Okay, folks, we are talking about The Practice Season 7, Episode 18, Capital Crimes. This was written by David E. Kelly, but also Lucas Ryder and Jonathan Shapiro. We hey. have a... Three people wrote on this and directed by, guess what? A first-time director on the practice. Okay. Joseph Berger Davis. This was not only his first director, first episode directing the practice, his first episode directing period because he's mostly a producer. He did, he produced 133 episodes of the practice. Also NYPD Blue, Close to Home, The Firm, iZombie, etc., etc., uh, so it'll be interesting to see how the uh, the producer directs in this episode. But before we listen to this episode, it is time for Mike to give us the very important. What is that supposed to mean? What's your problem? Is this what happens to women when you insert your penis? What? What? What does Mike think's gonna happen? Yeah, what if he would have drank the curdled milk? Then what would have happened? You know, Keith, I know there's a theme. I know that we're trying to jump the shark, but the truth of the matter is, is they don't need mm-hmm. me to jump the shark. I mean, they're doing a pretty, pretty good job on their own. So all they're I'm warming gonna say, up the jet ski. You can totally yeah. tell. Yeah. I'm gonna just this week. I want to just vote for something I want to see happen, and I know that it's what David must want me to want. Mm, and so mm. 
I hopefully it'll be paid off. I think it's time. I just think it's time for Lindsay to tell Bobby to go fuck himself. Ooh. They set it up the last week. In fact, when I came back from the ship, Jen's been quarantining in the back room. I heard her watching last week's episode. And it was on the scene where Bobby was meeting up with uh, Miss Fonda. And it, even hearing it from afar, it, it filled me with rage. It filled me with almost New York Giants-esque rage. <laughs> They've just written him into such a you know, and, and maybe, yes, he's an asshole. And maybe they're just unhappy in their marriage, and so it's fine, you know? <clears throat> you know, go out and... But uh, it's time. I don't know how it's going to shake out. It ain't going to be pretty. It ain't going to be yeah. It ain't gonna be lovey or mutual. I don't think there's any coming out. I think this is the week it happens. Bobby does the thing that jumps the shark of his relationship and cheats on Lindsay. Wow. Wow. Okay. Well, uh... You know, it's sad. It's sad, but not all of Mike's guesses are happy. Mm. It's just going to be one of those things. Well, <laughs> if you would uh, like to listen to the sadness that Mike has created for us, hop over to your podcasting service of choice, and we will see you back here on the YouTubes for the oopsies. And we... Our bu 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 back baby. Let the eagle so. Wow, guys, <clears throat> get ready. Uh, we uh, we just watched Capital Crimes: The Practice, season seven, episode eighteen, and uh, it is time for Mike to tell us what happened. Hmm. Two, three. Mike has 30 seconds to remember what just happened on the show. Segment, well, I'll talk over myself. Uh, there's a capital punishment case. It shouldn't have been because it's a state case. Massachusetts doesn't have it, but Ashcroft was like, let that eagle soar, baby. So Bobby brings in his like new girlfriend to help with the case, but also to like not have an affair by having an affair, but maybe mm -hmm. just a kissy-kissy affair. But Lindsay's stalking him, so I guess that she knows now. And also Ashcroft was like, ah, I know the committee said he's not death penalty, but guess what? He's death penalty anyway, bitch. Yep. All right. Now, could you let that eagle soar in fewer syllables for us? Life's in the balance when the politics steps in. Bobby's hot dog popped. Yeah, yeah. Bobby's hot dog soared. Let the eagle soar. Ladies and gentlemen, the Out of Practice podcast, in unofficial, unsolicited, unfactual association with David E. Kelly Productions, proudly present... Oopsie. The Oopsies. Celebrating excellence in acting good, lawyering good, guesting good, and being Tom Brady. Not to mention, this is where we rate the episode and stuff. Now, here are your hosts, Keith and Mike. What the hell are the Oopsies? Well, Jackie, they're a fake award show that begins every week with the soaring melody. Most oh, yeah. Indeed, indeed. Um, listen, it, lots of uh, soaring lawyering today. Uh, so lawyering. So lawyering, uh, Eugene did great work heading the team, but I think it's Jimmy Berluti coming in at the end talking about how he changed. If I can change and you can change, we all can change, baby. Rocky four in it, if you will, as a verb. So I'm going to say Jimmy Berluti. Yub change. Yub sib yub. Yeah. No, Jimmy, that, there it is. No, I, I completely agree. I think that uh, Eugene did a great job throughout the whole thing, but it Always really does. was Jimmy who came in and closed the case with, uh, you know, 
with a very cogent argument, both from a uh, practical, constitutional, and a moral standpoint. So uh, congratulations, Jimmy Berluti, on your MVL. Coming up next, folks, we got to give out, and you know, because he was on the television playing himself, I believe, uh, John Ashcroft Let the eagle is eligible for the best guest. So here we go. Already famous because you've been on TV. Getting a paycheck. Or first entry on your IMDb. Way to go. Oh. But you're the best guest actor. You are the best guest actor. You are the best guest actor on the episode. Uh, but who are you flipping off, sir? Ashcroft, baby. You're not getting, oh. you're not getting an oop. We're not giving you an oopsie. No, no. you're not getting an oopsie. But I'm going to yeah. play that video of you singing that stupid song on the outro. That's going to be our East little Easter egg thing. You deserve wait, it. Wait, wait. Which song? Let the eagle soar. I wonder how many podcasts and shows like that has been like a recurring soar. segment on. Because Lord knows we're not the first or probably the hundredth. I don't know. Uh, but it's going to continue. So... Uh, this is a no-brainer too. Great performance by once again. Let's highlight the the, <laughs> the kid's dad. Who was that again? That was Harold Surratt. Yes, uh, famed f also for pointillism. Not uh, as famous as some other Surratts, but uh, also very talented. Yeah, acting, 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 acting. Yeah, he really, uh, he really uh, connected the dots in his performance. Very good. But I think that uh, he. We got a, a, a glimpse into some of his great acting on the CW's Smallville, and this as sort of his uh, flexing one of his early performances here. Uh, the the actor's name again, Sam Jones the Third. Sam Jones, who I think is the character in Smallville's name was Sam too, wasn't it? You're the you're the Superman expert. So long ago, I was so young. <laughs> We're real. Anyway, uh, he was great. I thought that you know they wrote a pretty stock character here, pretty stock. Uh, capital S, but he imbued with quite a bit of humanity, and like I had mentioned, an arc. He did not have a long time to make an arc of a moral yeah. arc, and though yeah. uh, <clears throat> specifically his last scene was a little, you know, and, they, and I I thought maybe you were wrong, Keith. Maybe he wasn't as naive as they tried to. They weren't trying to portray him as naive in that in that penultimate scene. Then when they read life without possibility of parole they show his face almost with like a, a glint of surprise which shows me they're trying to double down on the naivete so yep. that he was let down by the direction but i thought his performance despite that was very strong very compassionate and very uh, emotionful so uh there's an oopsie for you buddy yeah no i i agree i and uh, for all the reasons that you said you know and especially because i i I'll talk about it in the next segment, but I feel like the direction of this was not strong. And I, I feel like First time the director, direction right? was, yeah, he was pushing the actors to push a little bit. And in the first couple of scenes, you could tell the direct the direction was like, shout it, be louder, be uh, scream it, shout it, shout it. And, and, and he was able to overcome that and pull it back for the later scenes and it's the same thing with what happened to rebecca it just like you know uh, you know, pretend you're on a sitcom and it's like uh, that's not good direction uh but he did a great job i'd also like to throw a shout out to terry polo who is performing this really well despite the fact that we all have mixed feelings about the the character and the and the writing of it i think terry polo is doing a great job so uh congratulations to sam jones the third on your best guest actor oopsie coming up next he's uh, about to face your philadelphia football eagles in the first round of the playoffs no 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 he's oh. not no no not yet you don't know you don't know that uh one of our cast members isn't going to be signed by the bucks to uh perform in a little segment we call you killed your podiatrist. Wouldn't it be amazing? Oh, God, be awesome. Michael Badalucco plays left tackle for the Bucks. Face. You're the best actor on the show. 
Well, some great performances here. Uh, I thought Bataluco and Steve Harris, some great, great work this episode. You know, generally we say whose episode it is, and I'm pretty sure this is a this is a, a Bobby episode. Dylan McDermott. They really, you know, the, with all the complexity, and I'm sure Dylan has some strong feelings about what's happening with Bobby too. He's I'm doing sure. Yeoman's work. It's it's very complicated because my guess would be, I'm going to give it to Dylan. My guess would be that he's going home when he's working on the scripts or in his trailer and he's having to fill in a lot of blanks. I'm not sure anyone is giving him a strong, this is where it's going, this is what we're trying to say because it does not appear that they do or they know. And so in order to perform it, I don't think Dylan can live in a place of ambiguity. I think he's got to have a pretty firm understanding of what he's trying to play. And uh, it's not a pretty place to be, but he's there. He he clearly loves his wife and wants to do the right thing. And I think that it works because Dylan has, Bobby the character is very Catholic and they've showed his <clears throat> moral beliefs. And I think he's conflicted with his temptations and all those things. And I see that struggle. I don't know where we're going with it from a story perspective, but I see Dylan... I see Bobby working through that struggle, and that's that's all the acting right now, I have to say, because the, the script is a little sh back and forth, uneven, unbalanced, and the direction is schlocky at best, in this episode specifically, but I think Dylan's doing the work necessary to at least keep us along for the ride. For all those reasons, Dylan McDermott gets my Oopsie Award for Best Actor. Yeah, I mean, I don't want to give it to him because I do I don't like this story, but, but here's why I'm going to, I don't want to give it to him because I don't like this story. And that means like, I, you feel something. I feel something. <clears throat> this makes me uncomfortable. I'm mad. I'm uh, annoyed at it. I'm also, you know, the feelings that this character is going through, like, uh, you know, we I've never been in that situation specifically, but like it feels very sort of high school and like and and like those weird conflicted feelings and, and it's it's confusing, it's all over the place and it's unmoored and dangerous from an emotional standpoint. That uh I think that's that feels lived in and I sort of see Dylan's processing the conflicting shitty selfish self-destructive impulses that bobby is having and and always had so you know okay congratulations dylan you get an oopsie award coming up next uh he won't be yeah i i i gave it away it's this one the tom brady award for being tom brady This week's winner for the Tom Brady Award for being Tom Brady. Tom Brady having an emotional affair with someone other than Giselle. Tom Brady. Oh, you know, uh, Did I do interestingly, because last week was having coffee with a woman who was not named Giselle. <laughs> okay, hold on. Redo. Uh, <laughs> wait, wait, wait. Tom Brady. Wait, I've got it. No, I've got it. I've got a better okay, one. Okay, all right, all right. This one's a little less about the episode. Tom Brady having his eyes pecked out by a soaring eagle. Double, ah. double. See, it's a double. Ooh, I like it. Wow, that's uh, that's some first-class podcasting, sir. First-class podcasting. All right, speaking of first-class, let's do this. Ladies and gentlemen, it is time to announce how many spare tires this episode gets. Oh. Okay. The let's start at the top. The 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 death penalty case uh I I I enjoy it. I enjoy what we're saying. I enjoy the setup, the payoffs, even the twisty twist of the payoff is like a direct fuck you to an actual person. It's using the medium of television to like actually have something to say and guess what? Yeah. I'm here for it. You know sure. The criticism I've had, we've had, going almost this whole season is, what are you trying to say? You've heard us say that a million times this episode. What are you trying to say? What are they trying to say? 
And here, when we talk about the death penalty, David E. Kelly knows exactly what he wants to say and who he wants to say it to. And he's using his bully pulpit, you know? And it's always... Whether, no matter what side of the fence you sit on with the, the issue, you know where we stand. I, it, I like when someone has a viewpoint. Whether you agree with it or not, I like when there's a viewpoint. And so that's very strong. The Bobby thing, I'm really trying to get on board. It makes me uncomfortable, which I think is the point. I like to consider myself knowing where we're going. I don't. Uh, I, I have the privilege of knowing how much runways left, but they didn't at the time. So I'm trying to give them a little bit of the benefit of the doubt. Thank God they have such strong actors because some of the writing is less than strong. Now, my biggest gripe with the episode, and I think you're going to talk about it too, Keith, is the direction here is not good. It's It does not serve to fill in the blanks. It does not serve to highlight important things. It serves to sort of I think he thinks he's trying to balance certain scenes with comedy or with underlining. Now, television and stage is very different. However, I'm going to use personal experience. I've had directors say, we have to we have to allow our audience to be smart. We have to give our audience credit. We have to let our audience figure some stuff out. I tend to like those directors. I've also had directors specifically in comedies, say, you have to assume your audience is stupid. We have to spell it out for them. Louder. Faster. Funnier. I've had them both. I have my opinion as to which works better, but what I'm trying to point out here is that there are both kinds of directors. This is the type of director I believe on this episode. My assumption is they are the, of the school of the audience is a dumb dumb, and we have to hit them over the head with it. And mm-hmm. I feel like in, in attempting that in a in a piece that is dealing with complex gray gray matter issues, gray area issues, that can be it, at at its best it can be clunky. At its worst, it can be clownish. Case in point, the Rebecca scene, clownish. I right. guarantee you, if the a director had just said, "Hey guys, here's the script, go with it." that uh, Lisa Gay Hamilton would have given you something very different. Uh, a little more nuanced. Maybe she would have tried something a little very... Maybe she would have spoken fast and under and, and more subtle, but it would not have been what we saw on screen. So that was clearly a directorial... It was also the writing, but yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, my point is that it lets this episode down in a lot of ways. Um, the writing does too, you're right. Uh, I just, I can't, I'm trying to get on board. I'm trying to, like you did, I'm trying to to adjudicate what are my feelings on the Bobby storyline versus my, and they always do, they do Lindsay dirty. Like, why is Lindsay following him around? Like, maybe he's been staying home late. They don't give us any of that context, right? We don't. Oh, you know, but Rebecca gave it away pretty hard. She did. You're right. But Why would something really be up, sh- Mike? Mike, there's nothing up. Ah, there's nothing up. Yeah, ah, but they didn't. No, even, but yes, but in that scene, if you watch, if you go back and watch that scene, and you watch Lindsay, she's clearly being. She clearly the act. Kelly Williams knows this scene is stupid, so I'm going to play it. She's doing the big eyebrows, and they're like, mm, "You're being funny, Rebecca." It's not like she was like, "Hmm, what's happening here?" Well, I don't I, know. I think I, I think the character played it cool, but anyway, go ahead. Yes. Oh, but you think and you think she took that and was like, "Oh, something's going on. I'm gonna have to." Well, how would you not? She got <laughs> know, slapped but, in the face. I know, but I'm saying like that. I just, I just, dis- I guess I like, I threw out the high score and lowest score, and I just discounted that scene. <laughs> I don't know. It. Here's my point. Whether it's the writing, whether it's the direction, whether it's just my feelings, they all come together to, to to taint the episode a little bit in a very strong episode. They really wanted, they gave it equal weight. And and the thing that kind of sucked is that they injected the personal stuff into the A storyline, right? They made Bobby bring her in. They didn't let it be two separate things because sometimes when we rate these episodes, we say, well, this we didn't like the A story, but the B story really helped. They they really fused the two. And so it's hard to 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 isolate them. And like, is it done now? I guess, like, is that character done? Or is, I guess we'll find out. Anyway, 
it didn't ruin the episode, but it sure kept it from being in the upper echelon. I'm going to give it... See, I put it in the sixes, but I don't think it's that bad. I, I, I really liked what they did. Normally, I'd say the twisty twist at the end was too twisty twisty, but I liked that it was a shot at Ashcroft directly. So I'm going to let it bump into the sevens. I'm going okay, to say 719. 7.19 spare tires. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I inconsistent is the word I would use here. Um, let me start with the stuff that I liked. I liked uh, everything you liked about it in terms of the message of this episode. I like that David has just stopped pulling punches with the sort of... It, it, political isn't the right word, but like direct about like... So I have a point to make about the death penalty and how it's being abused. I'm not going to like couch it in a both sides thing. No, it's like, it's not both sides. It's that side is doing this and mm -hmm. fuck you, John Ashcroft. I like that. I think, I think that's what that deserves. I think that felt right. I liked it. I also like it in context because going after Ashcroft and the Bush administration was very controversial at that point. We were in the beginning of the war. Bush had like a 70% approval rating or something ridiculous. So uh, I like that. I think that's bold. I think it's brave. I think it's right. It, it looks good in, in the eyes of history. So I really, really like that. Um, the... Uh, the sloppiness of that it's such a good idea and had such good moments but it was also really sloppy i mean this the the character not understanding that he's going to go to prison for life that's sloppy and and it just it, you don't need it you don't need it you already landed the punch mm -hmm. right you, you don't need it um okay so let's get to the bobby thing cuz that's what we're all here to talk about really um, I get, and I appreciate, and I value the more contemporary idea that your heroes don't necessarily need to be heroic and certainly don't need to be heroic all the time. Um, so I get it. I get that, um, Bobby doesn't need to be the like eighties drama lead sort of perfect figure here. Um, but this episode continues my eternal question about Bobby seven seasons in, why do we like this guy? Why are we rooting for him? What, what are we supposed to like about this? Um, what, what are his redeeming values? What is the per like other than being really hot and sometimes good at lawyering? What's why do we like Bobby? I don't know why. I, I honestly genuinely don't know why we like this guy at this point. Um, you know, and from the from the standpoint of of the writing of these scenes, um, as you were talking, it, it's it's taken a while for it to sink in, and perhaps this is my own internal uh privilege and and just going with the system. I think there is something misogynistic about the writing of Terry Polo's character. And, and it's, and it's this, her, her, her self-awareness and her, her calling Bobby out, especially last episode, we loved so much. It's a strong character. It's a character who knows what's going on. She's calling bullshit. She's making it clear that, um, he's not fooling her. Nobody's, you know, like she, she gets what's going on. She's, she's strong. She's, you know, reading the subtext and we're both like, I love this. I'm responding to this. This feels like a strong female character. I like the fact that she's not letting him off the hook. But now at the end of this episode, what did we, what did we really learn there? Right? The woman says, no, no, no. But at the end of the day, no, she really wants it. And okay, hold on. Just devil's advocate. Devil's yeah. advocate. I you could also view it as just like you there's no shame in the sex trade, right? Like sure. they, that's their job and they own it. She's owning it. Well, they kind of make it they kind of like have her demure out at the very, very end, but she's like, look, 
this is my, my intentions. My intentions are, here's this guy to sleep with. I, I'm just saying that you, you're either on board or you're not, but like, I'm into this. Let's do this thing. I have no shame about it. I'm not trying to hide it. I'm here for it. There's an empowering bit to that. Except that's, her that's not, but yes, I agree with you. Had they written that, then sure. You know, but look, that you're second making, scene, you're, that second you're, you're, dinner. You're making your own decision. The second dinner, like the, they the last thing we bit. saw was her like, hurry up with the keys. I have to go right now because I can't stop my, oh, my wobbly knees. Mm-hmm. Which is it, it not just, the it character does, you it does, it does enforce that the writing of that character was not in service of the character. That All that bluster in the beginning, not bluster, that bravado she had, or confidence, was not written in service of her character. It was written to be a foil for Bobby, or really a, right. a and, lore. And, and like, so this... So at the end of the day, af- after the trappings of the more aware, the stronger female character, she basically just collapsed into the exact stereotype that has been written since time went on because like Bobby looks at her with the dreamy eyes and secretly that's what she wants. She can barely contain, she can't even like hold herself back for 10 seconds, even though she is a fully formed adult and like, well, you wouldn't you say they double down on the misogyny that little bit in the writing too, whereas they have, now Lindsay's in the car and the dark shadow and she's the right and right and now she's this conniving like you know distrustful whatever it's 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 not good it's not good and and on on second viewing it's worse Hmm. it doesn't look better the second time I watch it or the third time 20 years later what whatever it is it's like oh yeah no that's that is not a that 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 is written by men, and that's it's not like a good the reverse character. moonlighting, right? It's like moonlighting. What made that relationship work was it's the will they won't they all the way, baby, till the very end. Whereas here they got them together after season two, and now they're like they're just dicking around with the breaking of them up. Like can't we? It, the maturity of the of the relationship or of the of the relationship, yeah, is being undercut by. The ridiculousness, which which is breaking up, like couldn't we have just well, explored two people breaking up? Right. Well, and they, you know, and and even though they they fainted, like she wasn't like the temptress. They, she ended up being exactly that, and and it was it, it was sort of false progressivism, whatever it was, and yeah, and, and again, like well, I don't well, have Bobby a problem. Lindsay too. Like, can't we just show two people growing apart? Like you said, it's realistic, it's it's contemporary, but now we've just made it. It's uh, just pulpy. It's pulpy now. It's yeah. cheesy and bad and and I and I think misogynistic. I, I really do. I, I think it's just like it it's just a badly written female character by men. And uh it just I don't mind telling a story. So the marriage breaks up. I don't mind that story. Bobby has an affair. I don't mind that story. I don't I don't it's not what I I don't want it, but I don't I get it. You know, I'm like, afraid I, of what they're going to have Lindsay to tell do. That right. I'm afraid of the fallout for Lindsay, like because it's the way they write that character. I just feel like it's gonna, it's gonna, it's not gonna serve Lindsay. <laughs> no. So, if I were going to, if if I were going to do write this on the death penalty case alone, sloppiness included, right? I'd give it like an eight point seven five. If I were going to do this Bobby Affair thing alone, I'd give it like a four. So I'm going to give it a 6.3 reluctantly because I, I don't know. I, I don't even know how to write any of this stuff. Uh, All right. Well, there, there you have it. We have now discussed this case at nauseum. Mike, uh, I, I think instead of explaining what it, because we all know what that means, Mike, why don't you sing with our buddy John and take us out? Let the evil soar like she's never You can contact us by writing at outofpracticepodcast at gmail.com. 
Or you can always hit us on Facebook at Out of Practice Podcast. Would you like to write us your lyrics to this song? You can do so at Joining the Journey and leaving a rating review on Apple Podcasts. Don't forget our wonderful sponsors, Jorge Navarro, Cloud Lover 69, Leanne Rice, Massanova, and Carrie Coo. Mike will put notes in the show notes how you can like donate to our so little show. From Rocky Coast. Now, if you to would like this song to stop, you should take out your device and hit it. Take out your laser and hit your device with some laser sounds. Laser sounds. Coast to Golden Shore.